the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I was talking uh, last time about the two sources of the concept of the unconscious in Western thought. Uh, one source, the Enlightenment philosophy, for which the unconscious essentially represented the dark irrational forces which prevent men from acting rationally. And I try to show how Freud's concept of the unconscious and his therapy is essentially based on this enlightenment concept. And then that there is another concept quite different, namely, uh, let us, I call it the romantic concept in which the unconscious is essentially life, in which there is a pro process against the intellect and in which you find, like in Caro's, the attempt and the ideal to connect life and thought, and in which you find among the more reactionary philosophers, like a psychologist, like Clagus, um, the idea that reason is really, or intellect, the enemy of life. And therefore, there is definitely an attitude directed against reason and uh, for this unconscious, which is supposed to be the creative source of all living. Now, I read after uh, the lecture here last uh, time, all the questions which I hadn't time to read, which were addressed to me. And uh, I uh, think that quite a number of the questions I shall answer today, or at least I try, and if I don't, I would greatly appreciate if those who have uh, written these questions would uh, write a, again as a question what they feel is unanswered. I cannot promise that I can give an answer which is satisfactory, but at least I'll try. However, I wanted to answer some questions right now before I proceed, <clears throat> uh, which were asked by a number of people. Uh, one was uh, uh, formulated this way. Would you please define active, respo active response to the external reality? This uh, was actually the term which I had translated from Kairos, active response of consciousness to external reality. And another question which formulated <coughs> the problem in a different form, which said, if one thoroughly and thoroughly underscored enjoys a concert, how can one be sure it's not really real? Uh, whether it is just conforming? Well, uh, let me say first, I would think that one of the most important facts in the understanding of psychology, that is to say, in understanding how man's mind works, <clears throat> is to know the difference between an active or a passive experience. <clears throat> now, that is actually not so easy because most of our experiences, unfortunately, are not active experiences. Uh, let, us, let me give you a simple example. Uh, you remember a person and you try in your memory to see his face fully, clearly, precisely, and you find that is not so easy. Uh, you find that it takes a very active process in yourself to recreate a perfectly clear memory of that person. Uh, you all can make the experiment, I'm sure most of you have, made, have had the experience, that that isn't so easy to see that face alive, clear, as if he stood in front of you. So you can do something else. You take a photo. You look at the photo, and you remember the photo. Now, you can feel the difference between the two approaches. If you try to see that face without the help of the photo, you can feel that this is a very active process of searching for the image of that person. But once you have found that image, you also feel the face is alive. 
while if you only remember the photo, you feel it has all the faults of a photo. That is to say, it is not alive. You see the face statically. Photographers here uh, may excuse me for saying such things. I think they are very good photos, which uh, can have the same effect as a good painting, but that's very rare. They're usually not the photos people go around taking of their friends and bring home later. Now, here you can see the difference between, in a very simple thing of perception, between the kind of seeing which requires your activity, but which brings something to life, and the kind of seeing which is nothing but a memory. You can see the same process in the field of thinking. Well, in these days, one always thinks of Vietnam, at least I do, and uh, quite a few other people do. Now, for instance, if you think that Vietnam, the whole Vietnam War, is uh, caused by the invasion of South Vietnam by North Vietnam, and that's really the reason why there is a war and all that, uh, which is what Mr. McNamara and the President say, uh, that's one view of the situation. If you begin to think and start to think, how is it possible that with our superior forces we shouldn't be able to win over the guerrillas? How could they be so protected? How could they be so strong? How could they grow unless the sympathies of the peasants were largely with them? And unless the sympathies with the, of the peasants were largely against a rather corrupt government in um, Saigon, well, if you start to think, then you may come to a different opinion than what you hear. But of course, you expose yourself to being called gullible by uh, Mr. Rusk uh, because you, uh, well, it's a peculiar use of the word here, because you don't accept the official version which upon uh, some critical thought seems rather implausible. Now, there may be some, quite a number in the audience who don't agree with me. Uh, all I can say is uh, the point is to prove that one has arrived at a conclusion by critical active thought. And if somebody who under the influence of a speaker who is in favor of ending the war in Vietnam comes out with a con firm conviction, we have to, ch to end this war without having thought about it, is of course exactly in the same position as a one who believes this is a war for freedom and a necessity for American existence, because both haven't thought. Uh, it is, uh, the problem is on one shoe as well as on the other. That's not the point here. The point is that most of what we think is not arrived at by our own thinking, but is more like a post-hypnotic suggestion in which we, something has been put into us by public opinion, in which we have never actively and critically thought about it, and yet subjectively we are convinced that this is our thought. Now, <clears throat> it is, uh, you can see the same thing about feeling. Take, for instance, a man who feels subjectively he loves his wife. Well, that's very nice. Now, how is that, uh, does that come about that he feels that? Well, because in our culture, we consider conventionally that a man who lives with his wife has uh, pleasant sexual relations with her, doesn't quarrel more than once in a while, they uh, have a common interest in the children and talk about them without trying to set one child against the other parent and so on, as it often happens. On the whole, they live together in a civilized way and like each other and uh, share many things and are both too busy to uh, have much time to think even about what they really feel. Well, this situation is defined in our culture as they love each other. Therefore, if you have that situation, you conclude you love your wife or your wife loves you, and yet the feeling 
is simply taken from a cue which is given by the cultural concept of what love is. You might not really know what you feel. Well, that's where we get the many divorces. So after a few years, people discover they love somebody else. Well, the dance begins afresh because a new person uh, gives again the uh, assumption of love because it's exciting and it's new and so on. And after a while, he discovers again that all this is the same. Well, if he has enough money and patience, uh, he will go from marriage to marriage and uh, always end up in the same self-deception. And yet every time, subjectively, he is convinced for a while, this is the great love. Uh, <clears throat> partly, of course, also imitation of the film actors and film actresses. What they do is chic. And so if you want to be a great lover, uh, you have many divorces. Uh, because that proves you really are so ardent and passionate. But the whole question is, how do you know whether you really love or whether it's an illusion? How do you know, as in this second question, whether uh, you really enjoy the concert or whether uh, you are just believing you do? Well, uh, I must say, this is precisely perhaps one of the most important questions in life. To know the difference between what is authentic and what isn't, what you really feel and what you don't feel. Now, strangely enough, when the thing is over, we often know what we didn't feel. Uh, you, uh, but that takes time, and it has to be over. While, while it's going on, we usually kid ourselves about thinking that we feel something which we don't really feel. Now, there is nobody who rings the bell. There is no expert who can tell you, now you really don't feel that. This is indeed the great, one of the great, or should be one of the great elements in the art of living. To be constantly aware of the question, what, do, what is real in my feeling? Uh, or what is just, uh, as I said last time, a thought about my feeling? Um, and sometimes it's very difficult. Um, when I see most of Picasso's paintings, I just uh, feel nothing about them. I don't like them. Now, naturally, that makes me almost as old-fashioned as Mr. Khrushchev was uh, in his uh, attitude towards modern art. And I tell myself, well, I'm not accustomed to this kind of thing. I'm too old. This is not... Uh, 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 a tradition which I'm, in which I'm trained, so maybe I'm quite wrong. But at least I try not to see beauty when I don't see it, because in the intellectual circles, which I otherwise have much appreciation for, Picasso is so, supposed to be a great painter. Uh, so I may, make, I may be lacking in, uh, in uh, appreciation for Picasso's painting, but at least I prefer that than to see beauty or to believe to see beauty when I don't see it or to be moved or to be interested or to be struck by something which I don't see. Now, if I had to answer the question, how do we really know what's real and how we, do we know what isn't, I am afraid this would mean uh, at least a series of six lectures just about this one point. But all I can suggest is use your own laboratory, and that is your own life, and the friends around you, or the enemies around you, and watch, and see, and try to see the difference. Once you try, you see a lot. Well, <clears throat> uh, to come back now to the uh, point where we stopped last time, I was just at the point of adding that Freud is in a peculiar way a representative both of the enlightenment concept of uh, the unconscious and yet in some way in the second period of his life, of his work rather, namely after the First World War, he seems to have come quite close to the romantic concept, namely in his concept of the life and death instinct, in his concept of the whole human being being ridden by the id, by the unconscious. And I mentioned last time he took that concept from Grodek 
and acknowledged it. I remember a question, incidentally, uh, which uh, asked me uh, about Freud's attitude in this case. I had said he was not too, uh, too friendly with Grodek, although he acknowledged his, uh, the fact that he had taken this term and this concept from him. I didn't mean to say he was unfriendly, but it was always a certain coldness, a certain distance. Uh, uh, Grodek wanted to come to Vienna. Freud uh, talked about coming to Baden-Baden sometime. I don't remember at the moment whether they, I, I think they saw each other once, I'm not entirely sure. But it was not at all the, uh, the relationship which Freud had with his intimate circle. For, for Freud, Grodek too remained always an outsider. If you read this book on Grodek, which I mentioned last time, you will see very clearly what I meant. Freud was not unfriendly because he was very much impressed by the originality of this person, much more than most analysts in Germany or in Europe were at the time. Now, um, so I would say Freud is characterized by the peculiar fact that he's essentially an Enlightenment thinker, but that under the impact of the First World War, he turned into uh, he turned into a skeptic. He turned into he was deeply discouraged, and at the same time, he got closer to the concepts of the Romantic thinkers in which the id is, in which the in which the id and life become very closely related, in which man is seen as a battle between the life instinct and the death instinct. I don't mean to say that Freud uh, gave up his early concept. I think Freud always remained an Enlightenment thinker, but certainly one who, after the First World War, felt defeated, discouraged, and lost that mood of optimism which goes through his work before the First World War. Now, there is one very interesting thing, and that is uh, that Freud uh, knew very little, apparently, about the concept of the unconscious uh, when he started to make his discoveries, both from the romantic side or even from the enlightenment side. Um, I want to interrupt myself and to say that uh, those who are, have no seats may try to find seats which are empty. I cannot really see myself too well how many there are, but we'll make just, I'll stop just for a minute or two. I don't know, there are not any here. Yeah. Well, I was saying that Freud was not familiar with the whole concept of the unconscious. He came from, is there one chair left here? No. Yes, there's one chair left here. Uh, he came from the physiological laboratory. I shall talk about that later on uh, because that's one of the peculiarities of the formation of his theory. Uh, and he could have been familiar somewhat with the concept of the unconscious because this concept appears in the work of Herbart, H-E-R-B-A-R-T, who uh, lived uh, between 1776 and 1841, uh, and he was one of the most outstanding German psychologists, and Freud's own teacher, Meinert, was actually uh, an adherent of Herbert psychology. So it is uh, still even doubtful whether Freud did or did not know about Herbert's use of the concept of psychology, uh, of the unconscious. But uh, certainly he was very little familiar with uh, uh, the whole tradition of the concept. Well, that is not, is of course a sign of his own originality that he uh, discovered this essentially on his own. At the same time, however, one should not forget that we all know many things by osmosis. That is to say, there are many concepts which are in the atmosphere of a, of a given culture. 
and which we meet with, which uh, touch us, which influence us, although we have never read the book in which this particular source is mentioned. I'm sure, for instance, that existentialist thought in one form or another, sometimes perhaps a little distorted, sometimes a little less, but has influenced many people who have never read a book by existentialists or who have never even read a book about existentialism. Uh, <clears throat> I think that holds true in all fields. You might say that holds true for psychoanalysis. Uh, basic, it holds basic psychoanalytic thoughts have influenced people although they have never read Freud because a thought which originates from a great thinker then is repeated by many others and it's, it, uh, it gets through to a much, much larger group of people than those who have read the original book or even the secondary source. And I think that holds true for Freud too, that uh, uh, both the Enlightenment spirit and the Romantic spirit both had had uh, influenced him, if not directly, then by what I called cultural osmosis. Freud actually came to the concept of the unconscious in an entirely different way, in a purely psychiatric way, by having witnessed uh, the phenomena of uh, hypnosis. Uh, now, this is indeed by far the best way to be convinced of the phenomenon of unconscious processes. Uh, unfortunately, in the years since then, hypnosis had fallen quite into disrepute, but for the last 20 years, it has been definitely gaining again in status in medicine and in psychiatry and in psychology. Any one of you who has a chance to witness uh, an, a, a, an experiment of age regression in which you can see that under the hypnotic, in the hypnotic trance, a person relives and literally relives experiences down to the experiences of a child of one year of age. That the, all these experiences, not memories, but experiences, ways of talking, ways of thinking, he come back not as memories, but he is that child of three. He is that person of five. Anyone who has a chance to see such an experiment, I think cannot help seeing, it's not a matter of believing, that in each of one, there is a great deal of past experience which in our normal state, we are not aware of. We can see something similar, of course, in dreams, but uh, the um, uh, hypnotic experiments are in a way so much more clear cut that, uh, and so much less uh, open to doubts or to subjective interpretation that they are really terribly convincing. And I think it is very well understood, and one can understand very well that Freud, with his tremendous sense for clinical reality, arrive at his theory by seeing certain clinical phenomena, and that is that in the state of hypnosis, things occur, these were not age regression experiments, things which a person is not aware of at all uh, come into his mind or are experienced by him. And also, secondly, he was very much impressed by uh, the phenomenon of hysteria, uh, hysterical illness, which is the one where most clearly one can see that certain phenomena, especially certain physical phenomena, are the expression of feelings which as in themselves are not conscious to the person. Now to the topic, what uh, to, I have to uh, go on, use this hour, probably part of the next hour too, to uh, discuss the whole question of consciousness and the unconscious in more, in greater detail. Um, if I cannot entirely stick to my program in terms of hours, I have to apologize to those who come only for certain hours, but it's practically impossible. I have to make a plan for the lectures months ahead of my preparing them in detail, and it's very difficult to, 
know exactly how much time each chapter will have. I shall try as much as I can to stick to the schedule, but and I think I probably shall be able to cover most of the schedule, but I think I shall have to use a good deal of next hour still for the problem of the unconscious. Now, what is the problem here? What is consciousness and what is unconscious? What causes repression? That is to say, what causes the phenomenon that something is unconscious? How can the unconscious become conscious? How is the process of derepression possible, or what are its conditions? <clears throat> and what is the effect of derepression? What is the effect of something unconscious having become conscious? These are the general questions we have to deal with. Now let me begin with the concept of consciousness and unconscious. And I should like to refer to the German word for consciousness, which has a clarity which uh, is somewhat uh, more than the English word has. In German, consciousness is bewusst sein. Now, bewusst is conscious and sein is to be. So what we call in English consciousness is called in German to be consciously. Uh, to be aware of being. Being as something we are aware of. Now, don't be uh, 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 shocked by the use of the word being here. I'm not talking here in philosophical terms. Being simply means the, here the reality of a human experience. If I say I am, I, that means I feel, I think, I act. This is to be in the various aspects of being. And what consciousness means is to be, that is to say to have experiences and being aware of these experiences. And the un concept of unconscious means to be without awareness of being. I am, that is to say, I feel, I think, I fear, I have desires, but there is no awareness of what I am. Uh, so that we can say unconscious means to be without awareness of being. Now, in order to be, uh, understand this fully, we have to begin with one very simple statement, and that is that there is no such thing as the unconscious. This is a mere abstract. This is a mere word by which I can denote something, but there is no such thing as the unconscious. Unconsciousness is actually nothing but an attribute of or a form of human experience. If I am not conscious of something, it means I am without awareness of it. And if I am conscious of something, I am with awareness of it. And thirdly, I can be thinking things, that is to say, things can be in my consciousness which are not, that is to say, which have no reality. I can think uh, that I can fly. Well, uh, my thought, in fact, is, has no limits. But I am not thinking, that doesn't mean I am aware of being, of uh, I am not, uh, I'm aware of something which is. I just construct something in my mind. So it doesn't mean that all is in our consciousness is conscious being. But it means that the difference between consciousness and unconsciousness is simply that I am aware or that I'm not aware of something that is either inside of myself or outside. Now, another way of saying is, or of expressing it is, to be conscious or unconscious is simply to see or not to see what is, either inside of myself or outside. And to speak of the unconscious, of something being in the unconscious, 
is a little bit like if a blind man would say that there are objects which are in the invisibility. The fact is he, can, he just cannot see them. They are there. He cannot see them. The whole question is, does he see them or doesn't he see them? But there is nothing invisible in the object. If I close my eyes, the object is still there. I just don't see it. And if I'm asleep, I don't see an object in reality. But if I would say the objects are invisible, I would be kidding myself quite seriously. Uh, and that is precisely what people do when they talk about the unconscious as if that were a certain realm separated from the function of seeing or not seeing. Uh, you have a, a nice word in English, insight. You have it in German too, Einsicht. Sight has to do with seeing. It's the same root as idea in Greek. Now, seeing into something, that is really uh, to be aware of what is. Now, as I already indicated, naturally you can apply the concept consciousness or unconscious in the sense in which it is applied by Freud only if there is something to see. Uh, that is to say, there is not a consciousness of something which is real and there can be no unconsciousness of something which is not real. Um, there is a question which I shall mention a little later, namely, are we aware of things without being aware of them? Uh, do we know things without knowing them? Naturally, if we, we think many things which are not real, that's obvious. A great deal of our mind is filled with fiction, which has no connection whatsoever with reality. But the other question is, can we be unconscious of something and yet we are aware of it? I shall deal with that a little later. It's by no means a, a, a mystery. It's a problem open very much to, in, to uh, self-inspection or inspection uh, of somebody else. Now Freud, when he talked about that which is repressed, referred mainly to, essentially, to instincts. To, uh, in fact, what he called the sexual instinct, which, as you know, he used in a broad sense. So it included also hostile instincts, which he, uh, in his early period, often uh, used identically with sadistic instincts as part, as a partial drive of the libido of the whole gamut of sexual instincts. But Freud was emphasizing very much that what is repressed, and that is important in order to understand Freud's concept, is not only the instinct, but also the idea connected with the instinct. Uh, in other words, for Freud, the unconscious and repression was the repression of a drive, of an instinct, of a force, together with an idea which represented it. Uh, I don't have the time now to go into this, but I should like to mention here that that's why for Freud, memory was such an important factor in the whole concept of repression. He dealt to a large extent with repressed memories. That is to say, with an impulse, with an instinctive impulse which existed together with his idea, which then was repressed, and the unconscious becoming conscious was to him to a large extent the recovery of the repressed instinct plus the idea. And this recovery took place through associations which led to the idea. That is to say, to a large extent, through words. Uh, in other words, the instinct itself was not wordless, was not mute as far as words is concerned. The memory was a memory of an idea, of a word, of something which was conscious, linked up with, an, with a force of the instinct 
and the recovery of the instinct of the repressed meant the recovery first usually of the idea and with it then you took out the uh, or you brought to consciousness the passion the instinct which was connected with this idea now that led to the whole uh, therapeutic concept of free association you try to get at those links which would lead you to the idea related to the repressed instinct and if you got through free association to these ideas then you had a good chance of getting also the instinct itself into the open with its energy and with all the consequences which followed from that. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me, uh, Freud was there talking to a large extent about awareness. Uh, awareness of experiencing experiences within oneself or awareness of uh, things on the outside. Let me make a, uh, let me distinguish between various kinds of awareness here to make the problem a little clear. You can speak of simple sensory awareness. That is to say, you see there are people. You see there is a tree. Now, that awareness of an object outside, a person, a man, a tree, a woman, this awareness you might call simple awareness and anybody who does not have that awareness is severely sick. He may suffer from a brain damage, he may suffer from uh, a psychosis, uh, but if he were not aware of the simple reality around us, it would be a sign of some severe disturbance and of course it would make living for him, uh, certainly living independently, quite impossible. But that is only the simple awareness. Now let us get a step further. You see, I see a man. All right, if I'm not very sick, I see the man, as every one of us sees the man. But in the case of what I would call qualified awareness, the question is, do I see that the man is sad? Do I see a sad man? Do I see an insincere man? Do I see a kind man? Or don't I see it? It is all there. He is either this or that or that, and it's actually written in his face, in spite of all attempts perhaps to hide it. Now, the question is, do I only see the man as a normal person does, or do I have a perception of a qualified nature? Namely, I see something more than is necessary to see for the purposes of self-preservation. I see a sad man. Now, if I don't see it, if I don't see his sadness, then I can say I am unconscious of his sadness. Because he is sad, only I am blind to it. Now, the same holds true, of course, for myself. I feel I am tired. I see, if you like, I am tired. And I rationalize and say, well, I have worked so much, or the, it, the weather isn't right, or this, that, or the other. But the question is, do I see that I'm frightened? Do I see that I'm angry? Do I see any number of things? If I don't see that, I am unconscious of my being frightened or unhappy or this or that. Now, I don't mean to say that all tiredness has necessarily such reason. Fortunately, there is a very legitimate form of tiredness which has no other reason than just being tired. Uh, but, um, and if we weren't, if that weren't so, we couldn't live because we couldn't sleep if you were not tired. So uh, my point is not to point out that all tiredness is based on other reasons, but there are forms of tiredness which are rooted in something else. And the whole question is, do I see that or do I not see it? Uh, it is just the same as with another person. Now, for instance, uh, let us take 
the following. I see that doesn't matter whether it's another person or myself. Let us say another person. I see he's angry. Why? He has a red face, he shouts, he uses ugly words. Uh, I would have to be blind and deaf not to see that he's angry. But do I see that he is frightened? Uh, if I saw fully, I would see he is frightened. And that he is angry, I would see too. But I would see it in perspective. I would see that his anger is actually only a secondary result of his being frightened. And then I might see more. I might see that behind his fright is something else. Namely, uh, that this man uh, is a very dependent man, and at the moment he is threatened in his need for protection. Now, there are several levels of reality with which I deal. It's true enough I see he is angry, but I am also aware of other levels of reality in him which I see, namely, that he is frightened, that he is dependent, that he is threatened in this dependency, and I might even see more. Now, if we use psychological language, it means I am, un I am not conscious of anything but the most obvious, namely, that he is angry. And the same holds true for myself. I am aware of being angry. Well, if I shout and do all these things. Naturally, I can't help being aware that I'm angry. Besides that, I'm also indoctrinated by the pattern of culture that to behave in that way means to be angry. But I may not see at all that I'm frightened. I may not see at all the deeper thing behind my fright, namely the fear of being left alone. And again, in psychological language, that means I am unconscious of my fright, I am unconscious of my dependency, I am unconscious of the threat. There is nothing in the unconscious. Everything is on the table, everything is there. The question is only whether I see it or not. Now, what can be outside of awareness? Everything. It can be my anger, my fright, my helplessness, my hate, my uh, feeling of love and on unhappiness, assuming I'm afraid of a mother who uh, will curse me. If I am really in love with somebody, then my love for a woman may be outside of my awareness because there is too much fright uh, from uh, uh, to love anybody, uh, yet it is there. My uh, sense of guilt, my greed, my sexual desire, my envy, my jealousy, my loneliness, my boredom, which is a tremendous area of, of unawareness. I think there's probably nothing more oppressed than boredom in our Western culture by far more than sex. That's the least repressed thing these days. Uh, but boredom is tremendously repressed. Um, and you have much more reason to repress it because it's simply a sign of a failure to be bored, while it's not necessarily a sign of a failure to um, uh, have all sorts of sexual experience. It depends a little bit what social class to be, you belong to. Uh, at any rate, uh, there is nothing which cannot be unconscious, or rather to speak more properly, which cannot exist without our being aware of it. Well, I uh, want to say uh, one come back to one point which I mentioned before. And that is the point, if I am not aware of that, what, that which is, uh, does that mean I'm not aware of it at all? Or do we have another organ, so to speak, besides that part of the brain in which awareness is deposited or goes on, which is aware without consciousness? Now, Freud, in his earlier writings, used a very interesting word. He spoke of unconscious consciousness. Uh, he spoke, uh, or one can also use perhaps the word intuition. 
Now that seems paradoxical, logically it is paradoxical, unconscious consciousness. And yet it's very real, and there's one case where you see it. And that is the times when you see, when your eyes open, and you suddenly see something which you hadn't seen before. And then you know I knew it all the time. You meet a person, this is a very banal but very real case. Uh, well, the person, you, you like him very much, you are uh, even friends, the person turns out after three years a very unreliable, uh, a very deceptive, a vicious person. You are completely surprised, and yet one day you remember that you had a feeling to which you didn't listen. It didn't come into your awareness, it was, you might say, subliminal but it was there. Or you might find a dream right in the beginning of this acquaintance in which you dreamed that this man had just murdered somebody in order to uh, gain a hundred thousand dollars. You had dismissed the dream as nonsense and if you uh, are psycholytically inclined you might have thought it's all about your father and uh, so it has nothing to do with the man you uh, were just dealing with and so you go on blissfully believing that's a very decent, nice man because he had flattered you, uh, because you expected something from him, or God knows what. And after three years, five years, ten years, you remember that fleeting second in which you knew everything. Now this goes on all the time. Actually, uh, we, if we were more accustomed, more sensitive to non uh, non uh, 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 intellectual perception to what you might call intuitive perception, we, if we would train ourselves to listen to a sense of what is real in another person, I think we would uh, be much less surprised. Um, of course, it's a very interesting problem which uh, I'm sure neurophysiology will also solve one of these days to find out how this difference between conscious perception and unconscious consciousness, uh, how, what, uh, to what uh, processes and parts of the brain this refers. Uh, quite obviously, there must be, there must be different processes which to which these two different kinds of perception refer. I should like, uh, no, I shall come back to that later. Uh, what I tried to, uh, while I dwelled so long on this point was that I tried to make it very clear that if one wants to understand anything about uh, the so-called unconscious, one must get rid of the concept that there is such a thing as the unconscious. This is sheer mystification. There is only seeing or not seeing, being awake or not being awake, uh, being blind or not being blind, about things which are, that is to say, which are real in ourselves. Otherwise, if one talks about the unconscious and what's in my unconscious, this is alienated language, if I could use a a technical word here. This is talking about something in which instead of talking about the process in myself, I'm talking about something over there, which as such doesn't exist. Now, I come to the next question, and that is what causes repression? What causes something to, what causes us not to be aware? That's really the question. Well, for Freud, the answer was that the cause for unawareness of that which is, and that which is, as I said for him, was mostly instinctive reality, in a broad sense, is the avoidance of unpleasure. And he developed, as he developed it most and more, uh, as he developed it, especially of one uh, particular kind of unpleasure, which is rather serious if it is real, and that is the threat of castration and usually the fear of the boy, uh, of his father, because of the Oedipus complex. Well, I'm sure you all are familiar with this, with this, uh, uh, that he will be punished for his incestuous wishes toward the mother by castration, so he's afraid of father, 
because of what Father would do to him in this respect. Uh, in passing, I just want to mention that's one of the peculiar things that Freud and most of the psycholytic uh, orthodox school, with a few exceptions, of which Grodek incidentally was one, did not see the tremendous importance of the fear of the mother and of the, of the woman. Uh, the fear of the woman, of women, and the fear of the mother. Uh, in my own estimate, that's probably a fear which is clinically much more intense and uh, more frequent than the fear of the father. Uh, now, but for Freud, I, I, I can't go into that now. I might talk about it later in these lectures. But at any rate, for Freud, this fear of uh, unpleasure, of castration, was a main motive for repression. That is to say, I don't dare to be aware of those feelings which would get me into trouble. And his basic concept there was that the main feeling which would get me into trouble would be the Oedipus feelings towards the mother and uh, the castration threat by the father. Now, as I, I want to say right now that I believe that the greatest fear which leads to unawareness is not the fear of castration, but is the greatest fear which I think man has, and that is the fear of complete isolation. Uh, the fear to be uh, a kind who is, has murdered his brother Abel and who is ostracized and has no place to dwell. Uh, this is the last analysis, the fear of becoming insane, because insanity is essentially nothing but the complete lack of relatedness to anybody, the state of complete isolation, which is utterly unbearable. I think in as much as we are animals, we are mostly afraid of dying. In as much as we are human, we are mostly afraid of the utter separation from others because that is more than we can bear, or anybody can bear. Uh, I shall come back to that, but I should like to talk now about a very important point in this respect, and that is the social nature both of consciousness and of unconsciousness. Uh, uh, many of you know the uh, story of a Chinese philosopher who said, I dreamt that I was a butterfly, and now I don't know, did I dream that I was a butterfly, or am I now, a, or am I a butterfly who now dreams that I am a man? Uh, this is a very pertinent question, because it points out to the fact that when we dream, uh, we are very conscious of what goes on in the dream. In fact, we are conscious of those things which we are not conscious of when we are awake. And when we are awake, we are not conscious of the things we are conscious of when we dream. And in both instances, they have all the quality of reality. And as we all know, it's a peculiar moment when we shift gears from the state of sleeping to the state of waking. Because what was real in one form of existence that of, way of sleeping, is not real anymore in the state of, of being awake and vice versa. So actually, we have to go one step further, and that is to say, we have really at least two situations of consciousness. We have consciousness and unconsciousness during sleep, and we may add during states of dissociation like hypnosis, and we have consciousness and unconsciousness during the waking life. Now, what is the difference between sleeping and waking? Well, you can, of course, define the difference by, uh, in terms of um, uh, electrical processes which go on. You can de define it in terms of certain physiological processes going on, but you can define it also in what I would call a sociobiological way. Namely, the state of awakeness 
biological, or more properly, perhaps sociobiologically, means we are burdened with a task of survival. We are burdened with a task of earning our living, of defending ourselves against dangers and attacks, and our whole mental processes are related to this function of waking life, which is a function of survival. And what is necessary for survival, that is to work, to defend, or as it may be, even to attack. The state of sleep is that peculiar state man is capable of in which he is freed from the task of survival. Uh, we couldn't live without sleeping. We couldn't live, you might say, without a third of our life being free from the task of survival. That's why in our sleep, in many ways, we are much freer than we are in our waking state, because we are not called upon to do something in order to survive. Now, I think that has a great deal to do with the difference of consciousness in sleep and in this state of being awake. Because our thoughts, when we are awake, are determined by the society in which we live and in which we have to survive. That is why I use the term sociobiological here. Man is in the peculiar position that he has not a set of built-in instincts like the animal, which are adapted to a certain environment in which he lives. But man lives in various societies. His instinctive equipment is relatively unfixed, relatively unfixed. But in order to live, he has to adapt himself to the particular society in which he lives. And this particular society demands from him that he is feeling and, well, first of all, acting in the way in which it is necessary for this society to have its members act in order to survive. I mean, in this case, in order for the society to survive. But in order to act in the right way, you have to feel in the right way. Because if you, let us say in modern industrial society, you are an engineer of a railroad and you would every morning uh, make up your mind whether you do or whether you don't want to go to the station and drive the, your engine. Well, then our whole civilization would break down in a few days because you might not feel well you might be in love, there might be any number of things, you just don't feel like going. But our whole civilization is based upon the unfailing discipline of practically anybody, which if you take a primitive society or if you take medieval society, was completely absent. If the carpenter in a medieval city didn't want to start making tables at nine o'clock, or if he didn't want to work that day at all, nothing in the social fabric changed. Or if the peasant wouldn't like to get up that day because he was drunk from Sunday, and so he doesn't work on Monday, again, there's no menace to the social fabric. Therefore, punctuality is not a built-in trait in all pre-industrial society. The sense of time is a modern thing, essentially, because in our way of production, people have not only to act punctually, but we can rely on the way of their acting this way only if they feel like it. You have to feel guilty if you are five minutes late, because that's the only guarantee that you will be on time. And you have to be deeply ashamed and not wait until you are fired if you are half an hour late. And if it happens a few times, you have to feel like the worst among human beings because otherwise this society cannot function. Now in the Middle Ages, or today still in countries like Mexico and many other less industrialized countries, there is no such feeling. You are an hour late, you, in Mexico you say, well, I'll be back in, in un ratito, that means 
very quickly. Well, that can mean five minutes, it can mean an hour, can mean two hours, and you come back after two hours and you don't even apologize because there is no emphasis on this. It has no meaning. It will have meaning once a country is fully industrialized because then its whole social functioning depends on the built-in trade with all the consequences of feeling one has to be disciplined, punctual, and so on. Uh, but even that needs to be protected. You must not only feel that you want to be punctual, you must not even think that not to be punctual is just as good. Uh, what I'm saying here, the development of the proper action in a given society and the proper feeling is related to the development of the proper thought. There is much which you must not think which is unthinkable because it doesn't fit into what I have called the social character. It doesn't fit into that mode of behaving and feeling uh, which is necessary for the functioning of a given society. Altogether, I would say that the system consciousness and the system unconsciousness is a social product, essentially. It has built-in categories which permit certain experiences, certain realities, certain forms of being to get to our consciousness or permits us to be aware of them and of others not to be aware of them. Every culture has a bill has a system which I have called the social filter. And only those thoughts which fit into that particular culture are permitted to go through the filter. Those who don't fit, who are unthinkable, impossible, uh, who are completely in contrast to what is thinkable in that particular society, cannot come to our awareness because the social filter does not let them through, although they might be in our unconscious awareness, of which I was talking about before. Now, uh, uh, I should like to talk, uh, to use five more minutes for the first part, at least, of the social filter. I had hoped to get much further, um, and that is language. Uh, there is a most interesting work in this field, which is over, uh, it's about 10 years old, and that's the work by Benjamin Worf. W. Benjamin Worf, W-H-O-R-F. Uh, the title is Language, Thought, and Reality. Language, Thought, and Reality, published in 1956. <clears throat> Now, the thesis of Worf was that the worldview of an individual is determined essentially by the structure and characteristic of the language he speaks. Uh, <clears throat> there has been a lot of experimental studies being done recently in the last few years, which are reported in a book which, uh, for those who are uh, professional psychologist, a psychiatrist might be interesting, uh, Advances in Experimental Social Psychology, edited by Berkowitz, B-E-R-K-O-W-I-T-Z, uh, published by the Academic Press in New York in 1964. Now, there you find the uh, reports on a lot of experimental studies which try, most of them, to disprove the um, uh, Worf's concept. To me, they are not very uh, convincing. Many of them take Worf much too literally. Namely, uh, you take 100 Japanese students or 100 Danish students, and uh, you then study whether there is a difference in their worldview because they speak different languages. Now, that, of course, is very naive because naturally I can speak another language a different language, if I live under the same basic cultural 
uh, system and social system, then the language does not have any effect anymore on me. It's not that simple that um, assuming I change to French suddenly and speak French after my 10th year, I, or I uh, suddenly by the new, different language, my worldview changes. It's not that simple. And also it is true that of course, not only does a language influence our view of the world, our personality, but it is, of course, the language is a result of a certain way of life. The language shows simply what a person feels. Let me give an example. There are languages in which, in the conjugation of a word, when you say it rains, you show in the conjugation of the word weather. You say it rains because you have heard it rains, somebody has told you that it rains, or you see that it is raining, or you have been out in the rain and have gotten wet. These three different possibilities are expressed in three different forms of saying it rains. Now you can see that if one has to express oneself this way, if one is forced to be aware whether I say something because I've heard it, I have seen it, or I have experienced it myself very directly, that then one's whole outlook to the world is very different. You, uh, if you ask people if they make a statement, and you would ask them, now tell me, have you heard that? Have you uh, looked at it from the outside, or have you been fully in it? then uh, this would change the way of our thinking considerably. I think if, every, if we had such a form of thinking, uh, that would be a tremendous gain in realism. Uh, but we don't. And therefore, for most people, it doesn't make any difference whether they think something because they have heard it, because they have seen it from afar, or they have really been in it. And that doesn't hold true only for the rain but it holds true uh, for many things of great importance for the world. Now, that is a way of experiencing life which, is, which differs from the way of experiencing life where one doesn't make such differences. Or you take simply uh, words. Uh, 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 color engineers estimate that there are seven and a half million discernible shades of color. Now that sounds unbelievable. Seven and a half million. The fact is, which sounds also unbelievable to me, that we have 4,000 English words for different colors. And the fact is that only eight are commonly used. Uh, well, in other words, our language is rather poor in distinguishing phenomena. And what I'm saying is, continuing the thought of Worf, that it is very important for something to become conscious to us that there is a word for it. Uh, I understand that the Arabs have 6,000 words for camels, different kinds, different states of pregnancy, different this, that, and the other. Well, because a camel is a central phenomenon in their lives. Now, we have, if we want to express, let us say, a certain form of uh, human relation, of, 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 of feeling, we use the word love. We use it today for ice cream, for the great love. You can find sometimes people saying, I have really a very warm feeling for my wife. Uh, and whether this warm, well, God knows what this warm feeling means. Uh, all, there is absolutely no differentiation in language. There could, of course, be several thousand words for love and hate, because there are thousands of shadings of feelings. But our language has very few words because it's not important. In our industrial society, what we feel is not important. We have many more words for different kinds of automobiles, which any boy of nine knows better than I do, 
then we have words for the phenomenon of emotions. Uh, now, naturally, this lack of words brings with it also a lack of awareness of the shadings. We are terribly naive and impoverished as far awareness of feelings are concerned. Uh, we talk about love and hate and dislike. We have a few words, but nothing really, which could even uh, come near to the variety of feelings, of different feelings, which even the average person has. The same holds true for fear, uh, for anxiety. There are two, there are so many shadings. In other words, what I am saying is that in spite of the fact that we are so advanced intellectually and in the natural sciences, our language has become terribly impoverished as far as human relations and feelings are concerned. And therefore, there is correspondingly a great deal of unawareness of what we feel because they are simply in our social filter. There is simply no place which permits the awareness of all the shadings. And there again, it's not because it's forbidden, but because in our culture, this is not really important, although we talk a lot about it. Now, I'm afraid this is really the time to stop because otherwise I lose any sense of time. And uh, I'm sorry that we shall, um, uh, well, that we have to go on next week with uh, the same topic. Uh, I'm sure I can finish it then, but it will uh, not be quite sticking to the program. Um, well, we'll have now, as usual, intermission with cards for questions which shall be distributed. Thank you. Mm. Uh, well, I have read, I have not even been e able to read all the questions, but most of them, and uh, most of them are actually very interesting. Uh, some of them refer to points which I shall talk about next time uh, because they refer to the problem, how is it possible that, conscious, that the unconscious becomes conscious? And that is one of the topics of the next lecture. And I think I do better just to talk about it then. And if that is not uh, clear enough, you can still repeat the question then. Now, uh, here's a question. You stated that we have to repress thoughts that do not fit into the pattern of our culture in order, in order to properly exist in it. Why do we then condemn conformity? Well, that really also refers to the question of how do we free ourselves from the pattern which makes it impossible for us to be aware of certain things. Uh, it is possible. I have spoken today <coughs> only of one side of the phenomenon, and that is how difficult it is to see things which are not visible, which are screened by the social filter in our culture. But at the same time, I shall talk about I shall ne talk next time about the question that it is possible to nevertheless transcend this. In fact, there would hardly be any development society if that were not possible. Uh, there would be no new idea, no new concept, no new experience, unless there were always possibilities for individuals or groups. Now, about the idea of condemning conformity, you might say that that in itself is often a new conformity. It is just fashionable in certain groups to condemn conformity just as much uh, uh, as a repetition of a slogan than it is to uh, accept conformity. Uh, one should be somewhat critical also about the condemnation of conformity uh, and should always ask oneself, do I not conform to the pattern of the group here? Uh, in my condemnation of conformity, just as, let us say, belief in religion can be just as much conformity as denial of religion can be, depending on the group. Critical thought is very much needed there. Um, 
Could you give examples of foreign languages which have more words to describe various emotional feelings than does English? Well, in the first place, and this relates to a number of other questions about uh, English, has, uh, has it changed? Have, are we poorer in words for feelings? Or here in this question, are there other languages which are richer? Well, I could, for instance, as to this question, mention Hebrew. Uh, you have in Hebrew, for instance, a word, the same holds true for Greek too, but let us take the Hebrew example. For one kind of love, rachamim, which comes from the root rechem, which means the womb. And love in the sense of rachamim is motherly love. And you have another word, ahava, which comes from a root to glow, which means erotic love. And these are just two different words for two very different kinds of feelings for which we don't use different words. We use the word love, or let us say in the English, English uh, translation of rachamim, it's often uh, translated in English as charity. Now that is a very distorting translation. Uh, if you call a mother's love to a child charity or caritas, well, that's a way of putting it. But it isn't what the word means. Uh, there is simply between erotic love and motherly love, these are two qualities of intense love. They can even be combined or blended. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we don't lack that differentiation. I could give other examples. Furthermore, I have to remind you of a very simple fact. If you read a great poet in English, or if you read Shakespeare, then you find a wealth of expressions, of differentiations which you don't find in our daily language. It's the same thing which I mentioned in my lecture about the colors. So we have 4,000 words to express seven and a half million of shades, but we use practically eight. Uh, in other words, our language has become very unpoetic. Uh, it has lost much of the richness, um, which it had now I am not enough of an expert to make a statement about the difference of language between, uh, let us say, an educated person a hundred years ago and today, whether he used a, a greater number of words, a more differentiated language for feeling experiences. I do not know that. I would be, uh, it would be very interesting if uh, such a study were made, or maybe it is made, and some people have analyzed this. But I do have an experience, which for me was quite interesting. Recently, I was uh, editing a book on socialist humanism uh, with many contributions from uh, Yugoslavia, Poland, Czechoslovakia. And I had to go through the translations. Now, to go through translations is in itself not a very rewarding task. It can drive one really crazy until you are sure you understand that the translator really understood what the author meant to say. But it was rewarding in one sense. Namely, that all, in all three languages, the authors used verbs rather than nouns. Uh, I mentioned this last time, I think. Uh, I mentioned the fact that we are accustomed to use nouns. Uh, we say, I have insomnia. I mentioned this example instead of, I can't sleep. Now, in reading these uh, contributions from, from philosophers of non-industrialized culture, it was very clear that, uh, in comparison with ourselves, they constantly used words instead of nouns, which gives their language, uh, in a way, a much greater freshness and aliveness than our use of nouns. And I think that has changed in the language. Uh, I wrote a book which has a title, The Art of Loving, and I am always interested if somebody quotes it as the art of love. Uh, here is the same difference between using a noun and using a verb. And uh, if you watch it, uh, uh, our modern language, especially the language, let us say, of Time magazine, I don't know whether they have any words there. 
uh, the language is snappy and uh, uh, useful for the use of, uh, and so many more nouns are used. I find the same change very markedly in German. The German of today is a very different German from the German of uh, uh, 40 years ago, the pre-Hitler German. It's a, uh, it, it has lost some of its aliveness. It is full of nouns. It is a technical military language rather than a language which is, uh, has a great deal to do with human activity. Uh, naturally, all this has to do with social development in a society in which we are constantly concerned with things rather than with human inner activities. It is logical that we emphasize more and more things, nouns, abstractions, rather than human activities. That is to say, human activities in the sense of an inner activity, I'm not talking about uh, flying to the moon. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's the best I can do with a number of answers which refer to this very topic. Do we not deny, say this question, the unconscious because we fear all that is monstrous and evil is deposited there? It's not the, is not the struggle to confront the tigers at the gate, in quotes, that's a symbol, of the unconscious so that we may become complete human beings? How does this square with your thesis that the, homo that the unconscious does not exist? Now, in this question, there are really two problems, I think, slightly uh, brought together, which don't quite belong together. When I say the unconscious does not exist, obviously, I meant only to stress there is no such thing as the unconscious. Uh, there is only the phenomenon that again has to do with the verb, that we are not conscious of certain experiences. So, the tiger at the door, all the evil is in us. Sure, the question is, it's not in the unconscious. The question is, we are not aware of it, because it's painful to us to be aware of it. But the phenomenon is also that we are not aware of some of the best things in ourselves. Freud has said that because the society calls you a sucker, for instance, and that's worse than being, uh, worse than being, um, uh, well, I don't know what, it's very bad <laughs> if you are a sucker. Uh, if you, let us say, uh, 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 give a man $10 and you are not sure whether he really needs them, or uh, if you, uh, are in business and would give away something for nothing just because, uh, I don't know, you like the girl which tries to buy it or, we, or because you feel she really needs it badly and uh, you can afford to give it away. Well, that just isn't done, although it's a very normal human impulse, which will be quite conscious in many societies, uh, which have a uh, more sense for the needs of people and which are not concerned with a certain economic uh, structure and principle, which is profit and so on. Now, you will find that most many people might have the impulse to act like suckers, and yet they won't think of it. They may dream of it because they don't want to be exposed uh, to the social criticism that they are fools. In other words, by no means are we only unaware of our worst, we are also unaware of our best. Uh, we are just aware of that which goes, which to be aware of makes one feel respectable and sensible. Um, and as I shall try to show more clearly like next time, this unawareness is motivated energy-wise by our fear not to fit in. In the last analysis, by our need of survival in a given society and not being an outcast. But things are not so simple. Then we shall discuss a problem. How does one become aware of it? After all, I'm only so far trying to emphasize one side of the problem, namely why we are unaware. Next time I shall talk about the question, but how does a miracle appear? 
uh, occur that in spite of all this, some people, and sometimes quite a few people, open their eyes and see, to speak in terms of Anderson's fairy tale, that the, that the uh, emperor has no clothes and is naked. Uh, that happens too. Uh, maybe we need larger teachings uh, to bring home a certain awarenesses of facts. But even that seems to be spreading in the United States right now. Uh, another question is, if the unconscious is only the area of not awareness, where then is a seat of the will to survival or growth or deep-seated extreme feelings? Um, let me try to understand this fully. If, uh, Well, if, the question is, if the unconscious is only the area of not awareness, now I would question the only. Uh, that seems to imply uh, that that is little, this unawareness. Uh, that unawareness is very big. Uh, that's not little. But I have perhaps to remind you of something which those of you who know Freud's theory a little uh, know very well. And that's a very important different distinction which Freud made between the unconscious and the preconscious. By preconscious, he meant those things which are not actually in our awareness at the moment, but which could be become, but which we could become aware of very easily. Let us say, while I'm thinking of this, I'm not aware of. Uh, many other things, because I can't have in my awareness two different things at the same time. But I can easily shift, then I can become aware of other things. But that is what Freud called the, the pre-conscious. But the unconscious are such things which we are not aware of because there is a strong force which keeps them out of awareness because awareness threatens us, and therefore it's very difficult to become aware of them. And that, of course, is not a small thing. That is not an only. That is something which influences our whole psychic processes, because it means that a whole part of our human experience is sealed off from our awareness and exists in a province which is outside of our total personality, and which only under great difficulties can become integrated in our total personality. Uh, is there not a terrific conflict between the active experience of consciousness and the social aspects of consciousness. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, it refers to the same point I made in the beginning, namely, what it does it mean an active experience, thought, feeling, and that feeling which is a pattern which we accept. If you use an extreme term, the brainwashed kind of post-hypnotic thought or feeling. Yes, indeed, this is a uh, 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 a terrific conflict, but most people are not aware of it, uh, that it is a conflict because they are not aware that there, is a con that there is a contradiction. They take that which they accept as a social pattern as reality. I have to add here one thing, and that is that our sense for what is real, reasonable, and moral has in itself relatively little to do, although something, with reason, morality, and reality. But it has mostly to do with consensus. That is to say, we take for real what most people consider to be real, and for moral what most people consider to be moral, and for rational and logical what most people consider to be. Not that we need a Gallup poll to find out what most people think. This happens to be the pattern of thought in a given culture or in a given subculture. Uh, if uh, two people 
uh, think, let us say, to take a clinical example, uh, if there are two people, let us say a mother and a daughter, I think of a particular example, who both think they are the only people who are decent and clean and cook well and are intelligent, then everybody else will say they are crazy. Yet they have what is called sometimes a folie à deux. There is enough reality to each of them to be confirmed in that delusion because there is one other person who believes it. And sometimes it is enough for a person to find just one other person who believes the same nonsense to feel sufficiently that this is real. That is a great danger, incidentally, to agree with a nonsensical statement. You may do great harm to the other person because you just want to be polite and say, yes, that's very interesting what you are saying. And you don't know that for this person, you're saying this, especially if you are a teacher, a doctor, or somebody in authority, may confirm him in an illusion which he might overcome if you had said, uh, no, really, that uh, doesn't make much sense to me. But that is a kind of thing which um, we usually don't want to say, although it falls under a biblical injunction, you should not put an obstacle before a blind man. And actually, you do that if you agree and say something sounds sensible when you really don't think so. You never know what effect it has. But if it's not just another person, but if it is even a group of a hundred, of five hundred, of a thousand, or a few hundred thousand, then of course that's perfectly enough to establish the sense of reality for the worst nonsense for the greatest immorality and irrationality for the members of this group. And they will solve the problem that they consider the rest of the world indecent or unpatriotic or uh, crazy or whatnot or unenlightened. And you find indeed contents which otherwise one would consider plainly paranoid occurring in groups it doesn't necessarily meet, mean that the members of this group are paranoid. They follow only the same principle all of us follow, only that they are so attached to their group that reality is constituted by what that group believes, while for most of us, reality is constituted by what the whole group believes. Uh, but psychologically, there may not be so much difference between the two instances. In both instances, Reality is constituted by consensus and not by a critical examination of what is real, which is a task of the scientist, but which is a task, of course, of everybody who wants not to be sheep. Uh, he doesn't have to be a scientist, namely to ask critically about matters which uh, are relevant. What is the reason for my assumption to believe that? Um, well, I guess I can take one more question. Uh, is it at all possible to develop one's capacity to absorb some of what you are saying where the concentration level is not high? <laughs> well, uh, that's a very good question, and it can be answered very simple. I think indeed one of the main conditions for understanding anything is concentration. And we are notorious in our culture for lacking in concentration. Uh, we uh, do many things at the same time uh, without concentration, and that's why so little things in. We listen without concentration. Uh, who listens anyway? Uh, uh, because we don't want to be bothered, really, with a problem. We say some nice words, which is also putting an obstacle before a blind man, in which we protect ourselves from being confronted, perhaps with a very tragic and difficult situation. So we want to get rid of that. Uh, we don't listen too much anyway. We, uh, well, we have a whole set of cultural instruments like our newspapers, magazines, radio, films, which all help to destroy concentration, uh, uh, which have a tremendous 
destructive influence, tremendously destructive influence and concentration. And I do uh, believe indeed that this question refers to one of the most important things of understanding, not only the unconscious, but even the conscious, namely that is concentration. Uh, of trying to be fully concentrated if you if something is worth thinking about at all. Uh, if it is, then it needs full concentration. And if it isn't, one shouldn't listen at all. Uh, well, uh, I think that is time to stop now. <laughs> Until next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.